Well, happy Sabbath, everyone. I hope you're enjoying the beautiful weather that we're having. And uh, I know this week it's felt more like, uh, like summer's here for a change, isn't it? I have a question for you today. Do you have skin in the game? Do you have skin in the game? And that's the title of the sermon today. No, the topic isn't about circumcision. It's about an even more sensitive subject than that. It's about what's in your wallet. It's about tithing. It's about tithing. You know, the Bible mentions a first, second, and third tithe. I'm glad he doesn't, that God doesn't mention a first, second, and third circumcision for sure. I don't know if we'd have a lot of recruits with that. So, um, but so many people in our Western culture define themselves by the money that they make and, and by the possessions that they have. But realistically, those things can disappear in an instant. We know, I mean, look at the volcano in Hawaii, all those people losing their homes, and the, the hurricane uh, that hit Puerto Rico and some of the other islands, uh, um, the Caribbean as well, and uh, people are still suffering from those as well. Things can be taken away in a moment's notice from us. Let's learn a few basics about tithing, and we'll get back to that. Um, tithing is, is simply a tenth. I think most people know that. And um, what are we supposed to tithe on? Well, we tithe on our increase, and the Bible talks about that in Deuteronomy 14.22. And we pay God 10% of what we receive as an increase. So that would be our net income. In Genesis 14.19, we see that Abraham gave God a tenth or a tithe. And in Leviticus 27.30, it establishes the tithe for the entire nation of Israel, and Moses tells the people that the tithe is holy. It's something set aside. And one of the things I'd like you to think about today with the tithe is, does God do away with holy things? I don't find that very often in the Bible. Um, so people who, who don't think tithing is applicable today, that's just something I'd like you to keep in the, in the back of your mind. Here's a strange scenario about tithing. God gives us all that we have. Everything we have belongs to God, including the very breath of life that we're breathing right now. He owns all the wealth and all the resources on this sphere that we call planet Earth. Then he blesses us with it. So he gives it to us for our use. He tells us to hold a 10% amount of that increase that we have and that it belongs to him and then he asks us to hold on to it, and he says, please hold on to this. And he says, but return it to me, just 10% of that. The question is, can God trust us with that 10%? And really, for that matter, can he trust us with the other 90%? Because we're supposed to be good stewards with everything that God gives us. It's a strange covenant that he made with us, isn't it? I mean, it's his to begin with, but then he asks us for a portion of it back. I mean, when you think about it, does it make sense? But we'll, think of, we'll talk about that a little bit more. And it's something that, that we agree to do at the point of baptism. You know, God has told us to obey his, his commands, and at baptism, we agreed that, to that in the covenant. Tithing changes things and it makes God our partner. I mean, who better partner can we have in this life than God, whether it be in business, whether it be in, in our finances, our personal finances, or any part of our life, our marriages, but God is a partner once we start tithing with him. That changes things. What better partner can you have? I mean, he'll make things good for you and he'll make things better. He'll make things happen. Tithing does something to us personally as well. And it's an act of worship. It's an act of honoring God as well. It tells him that we believe what he says and that we know that he's our provider. And it perpetuates and grows something in our lives. It's a principle of plenty. Turn to Proverbs 3, 9. I'm going to read this from the New Living Translation. Please turn to Proverbs 3, 9. It says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty, that principle of plenty that I just mentioned, and your vats will be bursting with wine. What a nice picture of things. Your barns will be filled with plenty, so you won't be, be destitute. You'll have food, and you'll also have some enjoyment in life. You'll be able to enjoy some of the good things in life, some fine wine. But tithing just doesn't make sense, though, does it? I mean, think about it. You take 10% of what you have of your income, and you give it away. Are you better off? 
We can ask the accountants that. Okay, you give 10% away, you take it out of your budget. I mean, it doesn't work. The, the numbers just don't work on paper, does it? It just doesn't work on paper. That, but that's because it's not a physical principle. It's a spiritual principle. There's something spiritual behind this. And God's blessings for us are actually a miracle in our life. They're actually a miracle. And this is a blessing for obeying him. The math formula shows us at a deficit. The blessings come in both, both forms, though. It comes in physical and in spiritual blessings. So, as we'll read a little uh, later in Malachi, um, we'll talk a little bit about that. Let's dissect some of this today, and we'll focus mainly on the first tithe. Turn to Psalm 50, verse 7. Psalm 50, verse 7. Hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel, and I will testify against you. I am God, your God. I will not rebuke you for your sacrifices or your burnt offerings, which are continually before me. I will not take a bull from your house, nor goats out of your fields, for every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills, and for that matter, every hill. I know all the birds of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry... I would not tell you, for the world is mine in all its fullness. It's all God's, folks. Everything belongs to our Creator. So it makes sense that the tithe is God's. A tenth, of a tithe, a tenth or the tithe, was given to the Levites as, a, as God commanded in the Old Testament, and He established that for us to give today. So even though the Le Levitical priesthood was done away with, we have the church in its place today. We are the church. Let's um, turn to Second Chronicles 31, verse 4 through 5. We'll see where God commanded that for the Le Levitical priesthood. Second Chronicles 31, 4 through 5. And he commanded the people who lived in Jerusalem to give the portion due to the priests and the Levites that they might give themselves to the law of the Lord. As soon as the command was spread abroad, the people of Israel gave in abundance the first fruits of grain, wine, oil, honey, and all the produce of the field. And they brought in abundantly the tithe of everything. So Israel obeyed that. Ancient Israel was to be an example for us today. That includes in so many things, but also includes tithing. God instructs us to bring the tithe to him. We do that today as his people and as modern-day Israel by supporting the house of God, by supporting the church, his work, and his ministry today. You know, this world is full of takers, and we start, when we start to tithe, we start to become free of that attitude, the attitude of this world. It starts to open us up to loosening ourselves from those possessions and those things that we hold dear in this life. We can begin to break, through, uh, break free of that grasp of our stuff and the security that we think that it brings us. It brings us to more of a uh, spiritual security and to see that God is our true security and not the stuff that we have in this world. We're called to be an unselfish people. and We're to be transforming our lives and this walk is a, is a walk of givers to become givers in this world. And tithing is a practice in letting go. It even opens us up to seeing the needs of others as well. You know, the principle of giving isn't always about money, but God uses tithing and a monetary principle to get his lessons learned. And it's part of his formula for our lives. It's a part of his plan for us. Here's one of the biggest rewards that we get from tithing. One of the biggest things that we as Christians see as we're faithful tithers and, and of offerings as well to, to God's church. We know that God desires and wants to call and save as many pe people as possible. If it were possible, every human being that's ever, that's ever existed, but of course we all have free choice in that. And in 1 Timothy 2.4 it says, it, it states that God desires all men, meaning all men and women, to be saved to come to the knowledge of the truth. God wants to expand his family. He wants to expand his family to all mankind and to everybody. He wants to open that up. And your generous and unselfish faithful tithes and offerings help do that. What better investment can you make in this life than to see 
somebody come into God's family and have the opportunity to live eternally into God's kingdom. Tithing is a true display of your love for others. God's given, given us the plan and the opportunity to understand this and for them to understand his truth someday. But until his kingdom comes, this is how he accomplishes his plan, is through the tithing method today, through this system, and through you and I. The work of preaching the gospel as it's being done today isn't done without some sort of financial exchange. So it takes that. It takes that monetary um, method in order to handle that. At this time in history, God's giving us the opportunity to be a part of accomplishing that goal. And because of this, God's blessing us with opportunities and blesses us with the opportunities in faith and with love and to draw, draw closer to him through this, this plan that he set up for us. It's an integral part of our individual growth and it's in, an integral part of getting the gospel preached to this world as well. So what if a person decides not to give his tithe to God? What if one can't seem to believe or have the faith or the financial discipline to tithe? You know, and that's truly between the, the individual and God. But sadly, that person's actually cheating themselves. There's a deep spiritual experience and lessons to grow closer to God that only comes through that mutual trust that you have in that experience of tithing. See, there's a miracle in that principle of tithing that takes place. You're taking the opportunity for God to show you something and to prove something to you as well. So let's establish this. God has more than enough to do what he wants to accomplish in his plan on this earth. And tithing is a part of the formula for our success. It's not a part of God's success. It's a part of our success. It takes me and you putting some skin in the game. In Psalm 24, 1, it says, The earth is God's in all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. You see, he owns it all. He owns us and he owns everything that we think is our stuff. He never needed us. He doesn't need our income. And frankly, God never, never will. God's a God of free will and of freedom. He doesn't force us to tithe. There's no IRS and there's no tithe police. But there are penalties for not tithing. You're missing out on that tremendous blessing of those lessons that God wants you to learn in that, and through tithing. Also, it's a form of worship and honor for God. You're missing out on that form of worship. There's many different ways you can worship, but that's one of the ways that we worship God is through the tithing system. But he does want us to do it freely. That's why there are no police. There is no tithe or IRS. Those penalties are are in missing out on that, those awesome opportunities that we have to grow closer to God. The benefits are accumulative and they're to ourselves, they're to our families, they're to the people in God's church, they're to people in the world once they turn and, and learn God's way. We're placed in the body of Christ for a purpose and we were bought with a price. Christ paid for you to be here. He owns us and that's a principle that our individualistic society, our individualistic culture doesn't like in America. They don't like to be told that they're owned by somebody else. It's all about uh, what we can accomplish, our goals, our things. But as a good friend of mine said that uh, as a part of our church culture, we need to get rid of some of the culture that's contrary to God's way. And I agree with that. God gives us a return on our investment, though. That's the good thing. We have an ROI that's huge. But it may not come right now. It may not be the here and now. It might come a little later in life. It might come even the dividends might come in his kingdom. I'm sure there's some things that God will definitely bless us with in this life. But how can we ever begin to show God the gratitude for those blessings and all the resources that he gives us? We really can't. And it's impossible to pay him back, especially since it all belongs to him in the first place. The resources and experiences in God's kingdom will pale anything in the insignificance that we have in this life. And no amount of riches that we have here can compare to what he's going to give us in the future. You know, Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon, just surpassed Bill Gates as the richest man in the world, having being worth uh, $90 billion dollars. 
how would you like to pale that into insignificance? And you will do that, but you'll even have more benefits in the, than that in the kingdom. It's going to be, you'll have true happiness. You'll have a healthy life. You'll be vibrant and full of energy. You'll have true joy. There's so many other benefits that money can't give. Some of the, some of the richest people in the world can be some of the most miserable people in the world as well. Money just can't, can't buy those things. Let's be grateful for the opportunity that God's giving us to tithe and be faithful tithers and also be grateful to the tithers that, that came before us, the ones that made this possible for us. They sacrificed a lot. Do we have a desire to tithe? That's something we could ask ourselves. Do you have a desire to tithe? What about being excited? That sounds even kind of strange, doesn't it? Being, being excited to part with your money and also sounds bizarre in America, doesn't it? But it's God's way of doing things in each and every one of us, and it's the formula and the miracle that he's working in us through that plan of tithing. Take a look at what we're accomplishing as a church and how God's way has changed you personally in your life. Has that made a difference to you? Has it made the biggest impact in your life? It should make the most significant impact in your life. It should be the most significant impact in your life. How do we feel when we write that check? If we write the check, I guess. Do you say, thank you, Father, for giving me the blessings, the job that I have to be able to do this? Do we thank him when we're doing that, that we're able to be a part of something bigger than what we are, and that it's a privilege to be a part of the knowledge of his truth and to have him in our lives? Something to think about when we write that check. Do we see the miracle in how few people in the world ha have what we do in that? Do we see the miracle of how much God's doing through his church with so little and so few people? I'm amazed at how much is being done at the home office. I've always been amazed. with so They do so much with so little. Now, there's a scripture I know that uh, what I call the, the anti-tithers don't like to hear. But let's turn to Malachi 3, verse 8 through 9. We'll start there. Malachi 3, 8 through 9. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have you robbed me? In what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Could we be robbing God? God doesn't want the tithe stolen from him, but he doesn't need it. Really, the lesson is, again, we're stealing something from ourselves. We're not stealing from just God. We are stealing from God, but we are stealing something from ourselves. And I think God's really concerned about that because he ne never needed these resources to begin with. You're missing out on a special part of worshiping him. And that has lessons for you and, and not for God. Lessons in faith generosity, love, insight into his word, and having a much closer relationship with him. And it only comes through, through the practice of regular practice of tithing. So don't just write the check and send it in. Think about it. Stop. Think about it when you're writing that check. Think of the blessings that God's giving you and what that's going towards. Continuing in, in Malachi, I'm going to read this from the uh, New International Version, starting in um, Malachi 3, verse 10. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I'm not preaching a health-wealth gospel here because they preach about physical things. I'm talking about some spiritual principles as well, but I'm not saying God does not withhold physical things from us in so many ways. Just look in this country, what each and every one of us have. He's definitely blessed us very, very much. And he does bless some more than others. 
But let's take a look at this. Get this. Throw open. Notice this is said, throw open because it's bursting with blessings. The floodgates of heaven pour out. So it's a flood. It's, it's pouring. It's not a trickle. It's not a drip. It's a pour. It's, it's flooding. It's more than a flood because the gates are burst open. A person won't have room enough for the, for the blessings. Call God on that. God won't give you enough to spoil you, that's for sure, because our best interest is always a part of his plan and well. He wants us to, to live well. God tells us to test him. He dares you to try him out. See if what he promises is true. Tithing is not just a form of worship. It's a special form of worship. It's a miracle. And it's things that God wants you to prove him in. Our tithing practices or the lack thereof may even be a reflection of other things that we're doing in our life. Are we sporadic? Are we sporadic about obeying God? Do we have reservations when tithing? Do we have reservations in keeping his law from time to time? Are we shaving a little off the top or perhaps all of it? How we set our priorities? We put God first Will we put skin in the game? Here's a few points that I'd like to mention about tithing that I think might be helpful. On payday, pay God first. That's always a good practice. Show him that he's the priority in your life. When you go to pay your bills, pay his first. Pay him that. Show him how much you respect him. Now, that's one of the things that it's probably a good thing to do to start our day is to start our day with putting God first and, and study in prayer. We can do that as well in tithing to show that he comes first. Second point is learn to budget and stay with the program. We'd never want to auto-deduct our tithes from our paycheck. Again, that goes back to thinking about it before we do it. Don't just write it. Think about it. I, I think that's a really important thing that we can add to, to that as a part of that worship is to think about that when we go to, to write that. Let God know how grateful we are. Grateful we are for our employment and to be able to do that and to continue to support his work and, and his people. Number three, it'll help, writing the ties will help to begin to break the shackles of debt. It brings our desire away from, from greed, and it diminishes greed and selfishness. When you let go of that, it takes a lot of that away. Number four, you're exponentially storing treasures in heaven. God sees what you're doing when your heart's right, when you're writing that tithe, and you want to do that. If you're doing it with, with a heart that doesn't want to do it with regret, what I would say is go to him in prayer. Ask him to create a soft heart in you. Ask him to see the benefits of doing that so that you want to be a part of this. You want to be a part of something greater than yourself. You want to help other people. Number five, tithing and offerings help God's church to better serve you. Actually, better serves you. That's what pays for this building, the utilities, the recordings, It's also a blessing to others. Um, it helps pay for the ministry, preaching the gospel to the world. There's also other services that ch the church offers as well. You know, for some people, tithing isn't easy. We all have our weaknesses, and some of us, and we have the weakness uh, with handling money properly. That doesn't mean that they don't want to, to tithe. But God does say that we need obedience. It just doesn't come easy for some. But if we just begin and then take a look at what we're doing when we do tithe and write that, write that check, step forward, begin that walk, and start the obedience, God will help, and to, help to show us. But the formula can only work when we begin. And we have to make that first down payment. If we're being responsible stewards, we too will not have enough room to receive the blessings as well. 
And again, they're not just physical blessings. There are other things which we'll go through uh, in a few minutes. They're living principles that God set in place and they're spiritual. So we can ask the question, why doesn't God make many of us wealthy or millionaires, the Bill Gates of the world? Why don't we see many of those with, among God's people? Well, probably because it's not good for us. But God will bless his people with their needs and the things that, that are best for us and the physical blessings will be poured on us. God will help us out of our financial situations if we're trying. He'll show us ways. He'll open our eyes to things. And he'll help us get out of debt. We just need to take those steps. We need to start with, with this. But it takes action, and we're required to apply ourselves and to be responsible stewards, to budget the finances. Ask God in prayer to help us to be good stewards over our resources. He'll give you the ability to manage your time, your talents, and your money better if we ask him. We'll see the rewards when we take action. Some rewards will come in this life, but again, some will not. Some, will, some may take, take place in God's kingdom. He doesn't always promise it the here and now. Remember, Abraham didn't see all his promises. He didn't see everything come true in his lifetime, but God blessed Abraham. He was a very wealthy man. And that's both physically and spiritually. But that's part of the planning of God's tithing system. It's, it's that faith that we're to have through that. It's a part of his plan. The book of Malachi does absolutely infer physical blessings as Malachi was speaking to the physical nation of Israel. But it's also about the spiritual nation today, which is us, the church. It's about the spiritual blessings of obedience and tithing as a part of that formula that God wants you to have as a part of your spiritual success. It's a promise of his goodness and mercy and abundance in multiple areas of our lives. It's abundance in a lot of forms, and we don't see it. We see it in many blessings like peace of mind, a loving spouse, favor in a, from a boss, a better job or a promotion, good neighbors and a loving family. All these things God provides. So was tithing done away with when the... Levitical priesthood was done away with. Let's turn to Matthew 23, 23. Let's get back to that. Let's see what Jesus says about tithing. Matthew 23, 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the other things undone. Jesus had the opportunity here to say that you didn't need to tithe, didn't he? But he didn't, he never said that. He never said you're not required to tithe. In fact, he actually reinforced it. These words you ought, these, uh, these you ought to have done, he said. Doesn't that reinforce tithing in the New Testament? I think so. He rebuked the Pharisees. He confirmed in these words that the practice of tithing was still in place. He didn't say that, that it'd be nailed to the cross soon. He said, don't leave tithing undone. These were Christ's words. But continue on in, in addition, he, he said, justice, mercy, and faith are all a part of what he expects. Also read Amos 4.4, 4, God tells Israel that a tithe, that we need to tithe along with keeping his other commandments. So that brings me to my next point about tithing and God's blessings. Jesus makes it clear that the other commandments can't be left undone. It all goes together. It's all part of a plan. We can't only tithe and say, okay, God, pour this flood of blessings out on me. It's time to bless me. You know, that's like Simon the Sorcerer wanting the Holy Spirit for his own personal gain and finance. The motive of the individual has to be right, and so, so must the heart be right. It's a part of the package that God has with, with, uh, with his obedience. It's a part of our covenant with them, and God expects us to be striving and growing in many areas in our lives, and he tells us to. 
And we're to be producing the results in our lives. None, and none of us are perfect, but we all need to be striving and continue to grow in, in God's way. And as we love God, so we keep his commandments. Our actions are the sweet fruits on the tree that God expects to see in our lives. The fruits of the Spirit. In John 14, 15, Christ tells us, if you love me, keep my commandments. You just can't tie the loan and then be committing fornication or, or stealing or breaking God's Sabbath. That just doesn't work. God isn't going to bless you for, for that. Obedience to God can't be partial. It's an all-in thing. And none of us are perfect, but we're all striving for perfection. We want to be like Jesus Christ. If God wants to... God wants to bless us. Help him help you. Make God your partner. Put some skin in the game and see the good things that God has in store for you. Have a good Sabbath.